Good evening and welcome to Bible Study Hub, the place where we go verse by verse through the Word of God and let it transform our lives. I'm Ann Wiggins, glad to be with you as always here at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday evenings. We've been in the book of Exodus for some time now and we are finally hitting the iconic, the famous Ten Commandments tonight. So what I want to do as means of introduction for this study tonight is to just remind us that God way back in Genesis chapter 15 and 17, told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that he would develop from Abraham's own body, his own offspring, a, a people for himself, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, as it turns out. And so we've been trekking along. We did the book of Genesis. We've been in the book of Exodus and the children of Israel, who are now multitudinous enough to be considered a nation, are about to embark on a form of government to almost like cinch this whole idea that they are an actual nation. Up until this point, they've been a people group. They've been a family, then they became a people group, now they've been a traveling people group, and now tonight we will finally start to see God develop the structure to make them an actual nation, which they are to this day, even though for uh, over a thousand years in between, they were not. They were scattered all over the world. God brought them back together as a nation again. Only thing uh, that's ever happened for the world is, is Israel doing this. No other nation is what I'm trying to say has ever been a nation, not been a nation for decades and decades and decades, and then come back and been a nation. Only Israel has ever done that, which is just testimony to the veracity of scripture and the power of God. So what we're going to see tonight is that God is going to introduce some laws, we call them the Ten Commandments, to help govern this nation that is being developed under his care. This is a theocracy. Theocracy means governed by God. He will be their king. He will be their Supreme Court and judge. He's like the top of the top in every possible way, the Supreme Court ruler. So he'll start off by kind of introducing himself in writing, and then we're going to go ahead and go through these 10 commandments. There's going to be some painful moments tonight, probably. I tell you that ahead of time so that you can buckle your seatbelt. If you feel convicted at any point during this study, let's just remember that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is a gift to lean into and allow to work in our lives, not something to run away from or harden our heart against. So if you feel that little prick, please don't leave. Please lean into it and let the Holy Spirit do the work in your heart and life that he wants to do. In the end, oh my goodness, it's it's the biggest blessing. What a gift that we have in that, right? So we're all going to feel convicted tonight, I'm pretty sure. Let's get started now. In chapter 20 of Exodus, I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, if you're interested, which is similar to the English Standard Version, uh, very similar, but if you want to look it up on BibleGateway.com, you'll just click on the Legacy Standard Bible and you'll get the exact version that I'm using. So here we go. Exodus, um, yeah, I say, yeah, I have Exodus 1. It, it's, it's actually Exodus 20. I'm so sorry, got that wrong. Exodus 20, 1 to 2, and it says this, then God spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So he kind of sits down who he is and what he did to say to his people, I am worthy of being your supreme ruler. So that's all that that is. Moving on from there. That's just a little intro. I, I did, how often did I do this? I can't believe I didn't catch this. I've been through my notes so many times. I still have Exodus 1. No idea. Please disregard that. It's Exodus 20, verse 3. I hope I didn't do that the whole way through. I might have. It's so humbling. All right. I'm totally humbled. Exodus 20, verse 3 says this. First commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. So let me run over here because I'm going to, for your sake, we're going to just kind of list these out as we go. So commandment number one, written on a tablet of stone in the hearing of all the people, they're all listening to God do this. No other gods before me. Now, I was listening to somebody last, a uh, couple weeks ago, somebody who uh, 
leads a church and shouldn't, has no qualifications to do so. But she was, she actually referenced this and, and her interpretation of it made my mouth fall open. She said now, uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm getting this almost exactly the way she said it. She said, now we know, you know, no other gods before me. And then, and then she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, of course, we all have other gods. Like this is totally fine. Of course, we all have other gods. The thing is, just make sure that they don't ever get in front of, you know, God. What? This is this is how you in, received this? This is how you interpreted? I was floored. I, I said to my husband, who is a pastor, if you don't know him, later on that day, I said, you're not going to believe this. And I told him what she had said, thinking he would be equally as aghast. And, and he was, but he said, he said, that's not uncommon. <laughs> To, to receive it that way. And I said, what? No other God? He said, yeah, because they take it like before, like a preposition, like in order of like, you know, you, you put the garlic in the pan before the zucchini, you know, that's, that's kind of like in time and space. So I just want to make sure that nobody is receiving it that way, because that is not what it means. If the King of England called you in to his presence and they said, the King has called you to come before him, you wouldn't take that to mean you're going to be in front of him. You would take that to mean you're going to be in his presence, right? Before the king. Very common. That's what this means. So what God is saying here is not there's an order of gods and I just want to be the first one in line. No, he is the only God. Don't bring any other gods into his presence. There should be no other gods ever, ever in your presence or in his. He is the only God, one God. He's it. That's it. So that's what that means. That's what that means. Let's go on. Commandment two. Oh, good. I got the reference right. <laughs> Exodus 20, four to six. It says this, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. So he really is very specific. Nothing, nothing. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. All right. So heading over to our little list here. Commandment number two. Oops. So first is no other gods before me. And then almost as an extension of this is no graven images. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, that's pretty easy because I don't think anybody really does that anymore. I mean, I don't know of anybody who has a bunch of idols set up in their house. Actually, we do still have quite a bit of that going on. Here's some idols that you could go to Africa and buy anytime you would want to. And I'll linger on that for a moment because I just want you to notice, I mean, they're just ghastly. These are demon-inspired objects. And most of the time when people worship objects like this, they're, they are not thinking that the object itself is an actual God. They know that the object represents a deity, a, a spirit out there. And they're really worshiping that, but it kind of encapsulates itself in that visual for them. This one I find utterly terrifying. From Haiti, these are some, I don't know if these are voodoo dolls or gods or what, something involved in their religious uh, worship. If that's not demonic, I don't know what it is. I can't even keep it on the screen because it freaks me out. This is a Hindu god. I um, I was talking with my producer, Angeline, who is an expert in Hinduism. And I asked her tonight, I said, is it true that there are millions of Hindu gods? And she said, yes, because every family in India makes its own family god and like develops its own God and then builds an altar to it. And then the family worships it. And there's obviously millions of people in India. So right there, you have millions of gods. And then you have all the like communal gods, which this is one of, and it's absolutely hideous. Now I'm going to pop up one more and this one's going to sting a little bit to some of you, but I'm going to pop it up anyway, because I think you are interested in the truth more than you are interested in being coddled. And so here it is. How is that please different from this. We have two people, both of whom are bowing down to some kind of graven image. It's not okay. In the Catholic Catechism, 
because this is a problem, they have removed the second commandment. They've scrubbed it from the catechism. I'm going to pop up here in case you want to take a screenshot and look this up later. From their own website at catholic.com, you can read about how and why they think this is fine. And it basically boils down to, well, it's tradition that this is how we do it. What they do is they take the second commandment out and then they divide the very last com commandment, which is not to covet, into two sections to make it 10 commandments so nobody really notices that they knocked one of them out. If you are counting on an entity that would take pieces of the Bible out because it doesn't work with what they want to do, if you're trusting them to tell you how to get to heaven, I think that's a bad idea. I'm just going to say that out loud. You want to trust a source for your eternity that doesn't lie to you. And that only source is the Bible itself. So go to the Bible for your truth. Don't go to an entity, especially one that will do things like take pieces of the Bible out. And a lot of religions will do that. I mean, they almost have to, right? Because they bump up against the word of God and, and it's a problem for them. So I had to say that. If you, um, if you look at Revelation chapter 22, you'll notice that John falls down before an angel to worship him. John, the apostle John. And the angel says, get up. Don't do that. Worship God and him only. Don't worship me. We are to never worship anything except for the one true God. Now, we're going to move on from this. But before we do, if, you, if you're like, okay, got it. Good to know. Thank you. But I'm really concerned about that statement about God visiting the iniquities of the fathers on, to the third and fourth generation of children. And maybe you're saying to yourself, oh my goodness, does that mean that if I mess up, like my grandchildren and great grandchildren would have to maybe pay for my sins or maybe I'm paying for the sins of my great grandparents? Is that how that works? That's not what this verse is saying at all. You don't have to pay for the sins that somebody else committed. You pay for your own, right? Well. You're responsible. We'll put it that way. You're we'll get to this later, but you're responsible for your own sins. You're not responsible. That's a better way to put it for the sins of other people. What this is saying is basically the New Testament principle of sowing and reaping. So in other words, remember, this is, this is like a legal document that God is developing here that will help govern his people. So what he's saying is, listen, if you as parents bring false gods into your home, you bring in other religions and you worship these demon gods, your children will necessarily be affected by that. And probably they will adopt those practices and their children will adopt those practices. And pretty soon, it doesn't take too many generations, they have no idea who the one true God is. And because of that, I will have to judge your nation because it will be so prolific throughout the nation. And that could be two, three, four generations down the line. You caused it, and they're going to have to reap the benefits or the consequences of that. And, and notice that it says, to those who hate me. Never does it say that he'll visit the consequences on people who love him and they're paying for their grandparents' transgressions. If it continues down the line, if you sow idolatry and a couple generations down the line, you've reaped the full transgression of that those people are going to have to deal with the consequences that you initiated. Does that make sense? And then in verse 6 too, cons you know, conversely, it says for those who, who love him, he shows his, his loving kindness, right? So it works both directions. It's why we are so concerned for our next generation always, that, that you raise your children, that you pour into your grandchildren's lives with the truth of the word of God and that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior from the youngest age possible so that they can continue that legacy for generations that go on and on. All righty. Verse three. Here we go. Commandment three. Verse seven. Here we go. It says this. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, your God, in vain, for Yahweh will not leave un him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So we are up to commandment three, and here it is. So no other gods before me, no graven images, and don't take the name of God in vain. 
it was a couple of years ago. I was reading something and honestly, I don't even remember what it was, but there was a quote that really jumped out to me. The the author of this article was was actually quoting somebody who was born and raised in the Midwest, which I was, a number of you live in the Midwest. And and the author quoted this person as saying, "Oh, and then whatever they said. And and the author said, you know, in typical Midwestern fashion, they said, oh, O-P-E, oh, and then blah, blah, blah. And I saw that and I thought, what? Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, I lived in the Midwest from the age of birth through 25. I have never heard anybody say, oh, you don't say, oh, who says, oh, oh this is the strangest thing. And I thought and thought it like, have I ever heard that? No, I don't think I ever have. I say it all the time <laughs> by about two hours into that day after reading that, I caught myself being like, oh, and then blah, blah, blah. Oh, da, da, da. I, constant. It's constant. I had never noticed that I did this. I was floored. I just had never heard myself say it because I'd never thought about it before. And I remember it was that night or maybe the next day I said to my children, I said, listen, have you ever noticed that I say oh? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> I said, wait, you really? You've noticed that? They go, mom, you say it all the time. I said, oh my goodness. I didn't know. I said, do you say it? And they're like, no, we were born and raised in Arizona. Nobody says it out there, just you. But they said, most Midwesterners will say, <laughs> will say it. I had no idea. I say it all the time. And it still cracks me up every time it pops out of my mouth or in my brain. Oh, oh, there it is. There, I just said it again. How many of you Midwesterners do that? Here's the reason I bring up that story. Until somebody pointed it out, I didn't hear myself doing it. I had no idea I had ever said it before. I hear Christians, those who claim the name of Christ, all the time taking God's name in vain. O-M-G. Oh my G-O-D. I hear it all the time. Oh, I, I expect to hear it from people who have nothing to do with Christ or who hate God. I, it's not okay, but I expect it. It always floors me when I hear my brothers and sisters in Christ throw around the name of God or Jesus like a piece of trash. And my thought is it's probably somewhat like, oh, my guess is that half of them don't even know that they're doing it. They they don't even hear themselves. It's so much a part of their culture, so much a part of what they hear all the time from other family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, whatever, that it just flies out of their mouth and they're not aware of it. So can I just say this to you, not in a judgmental way, but just in a, I think we can do way, way better here because this is blasphemy and it's really serious, would you start listening to yourself? And will you make sure that you don't do that? There was a little friend of my son's way back when my son Matthew was in about sixth grade. His name was Charlie. Charlie was a little Jewish boy and I adored him. He was a typical sixth grade boy. Once in a while, he'd come over to play and it was like bonkers all over my house the entire time that he and Matthew were together. It was absolutely mayhem. But I love this little boy. He was crazy. But he always said, oh, my G-O-D. Like, it, it was just flowing all the time. And finally, one day, I thought, you know what? He's in my house. And, and I don't want him to feel judged. I don't want him to feel like I'm mad at him. But I don't want that in my home. I, I love God. I, I honor him. And I want his name to be lifted up in my house, not thrown around like garbage or like some four-letter word. And so I just pulled him aside. And I said, hey, Charlie, you know I, I love you. I said, you're saying something that's really hurting my heart. And I said, when you say, oh, my G-O-D, I said, it's, it sounds to me like you're taking the name of my God that I love and just using it like a piece of trash. And it really hurts me every time you do it. And I have expected him to be bonkers and bounce all over the place. Ah! Like, you know, I've never seen a child get so serious in my life. His face completely changed. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think God is a piece of trash either. And I said, okay, then you, then you know what to do. And he said, yeah. And he never did it again in my presence. So I think let's be careful on this one. This one is a, it's a, we, we can think it's not a big deal. And actually it's a really, really big deal. 
Next, commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh to your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or your female slave or your cattle or your sojourner who is with you in your gates. In other words, you can't just put it on somebody else and say, oh, I didn't do it. I made them do it. You can't make anybody do it. For in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So here we go. We're up to commandment number four. And there it is, to keep the Sabbath. Now, there's always this, this thought of, as Christians, are we responsible for keeping the Sabbath? Are we required to do it? And there are Christians, uh, really, really good, strong, Bible-believing, even teachers, who are kind of on both sides of this. Some of them say, no, we're not bound by that anymore. It's the only commandment in the New Testament of the 10 that is not reiterated, which is kind of an interesting point. And then others say, no, it's, a, it's in the moral code. The moral code doesn't change. You need to do it. So here's kind of where I fall on it. I look at how Jesus kept the Sabbath and he didn't keep the rules that the religious leaders had imposed on the people that made the day like the most hellish day of the week for them, where they couldn't do anything. If he needed to eat, they got food. If he wanted to heal somebody, he healed somebody. So he did work, if you want to call it that, on the Sabbath, but just, you know, to, to bless people and to take care of himself. But he also took a day to rest and commune with God. And I think that's the spirit of what we're supposed to do. If you work seven days a week, very often, you'll notice it really takes a toll on your physical health because we're not designed to do it. Just like your car is not designed to run and run and run with no oil change. You can do that to your car, but you're going to pay for it eventually. It needs to have the oil changed every so many miles. You need to rest. That's your oil change. You need to rest at least one day a week. And that is a day to focus on God. It's not a day to make it miserable. Enjoy creation. Enjoy your family. Go to church. Worship sing, focus on the Lord, read, whatever, but just take a day to rest and focus on God. That's it. It's actually a blessing. It shouldn't be a curse. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land, which Yahweh, your God gives you. I just want to point out again, this is God giving rules to his people, their moral code. So it does apply to us today because God's morality does not change. It's the same thing. But you can see here what he's saying is honor your father and mother that you can stay in the promised land. In other words, if you don't honor your father and mother, eventually I'm going to pull you out of the promised land. Now, in the New Testament, this is reiterated, but it's kind of um, worked into the church by saying that your days will be long, you know, so not necessarily the promised land, but that your life will be longer and more fulfilled in those types of things. So the principle here is, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. You want to pour into your children and expect from them the obedience that God wants them to give you. And by the way, honor your father and mother implies that the father and mother are being honorable, that they're doing things that can be honored, that they're not mistreating the children and acting hypocritically in those types of things. So the family structure has been instituted by God to procreate and to protect women and children primarily. And so you can see that protection there and how that works. Let's go to the next one. Commandment number six. We're over halfway done now. You shall not murder. All right, let's pop it up. Commandment six, there it is. So we've got our little list going on here. You shall not murder. Well, that one is pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? Murder is the taking of the life of an innocent person. That's it. So if you're wondering, well, you know, what about capital punishment then? Is that wrong? Is it um, wrong to have war? Should we be pacifists? The, the answer is that no, because that's not the taking of innocent life. Capital punishment was instituted by God in the Old Testament. It is carried through in Romans chapter 13 in the New Testament, that government exists to protect people. And there are times when crimes are so heinous that justice involves taking a life for a life. That's biblical. So it doesn't entail that. War is knowingly going into battle 
knowing that this might result in your death. So it's different than just the ambush and the taking of an innocent life. But from, from, oh, sorry, I have, I forgot to take this thing down. So I'm talking to like nobody. There you go. Um, so what, what I want to say about that is from conception to natural death, life is protected by God and that nobody has the right to take innocent life. The only caveats would be capital punishment and war situations. Other than that, no murder. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. All right. Let me pop up our thing and I'll try to remember to take it down this time. There it is. All right, good. We can all see it and it's down. All right. So the adultery thing is specifically involving somebody who is married going outside of the marriage and having sexual relations with somebody outside. We know from other places, many other places in scripture, that is not the only sexual sin that you can be single and have sex before marriage. And that is also a sin. Homosexuality, also a sin. So anything that isn't in the confines of marriage between one man and one woman in covenant marriage for life is considered sexual sin. But for the purposes of what God is explaining here, he limits it to adultery. But I think we know it entails more than that. Commandment number eight, we're almost done. You shall not steal. All right. So back over commandment eight. Here's the list. You can see it. You shall not steal. Of course, stealing involves taking something that doesn't belong to you. And it's irrespective of its value, by the way. You'll notice he doesn't say you shall not steal big stuff, but the small stuff you're, fi you're fine with. No, it's taking anything that doesn't belong to you. It's very broad and it's very convicting. Number nine, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this one is really important for one specific reason. As you can tell from the context, it doesn't just say don't lie, although that is exactly what it's talking about. This is in a judicial sort of sense. This is a court situation. If you have a society where witnesses in a court of law are able to make up stuff and lie all the time, your society will absolutely implode. It cannot sustain that. It's a kangaroo court every single time at that point. People are in jail that shouldn't be. People aren't in jail that should be. It's an absolute disaster. So what God is doing, again, because he's setting the law up for the nation of Israel, is when we have court, you must tell the truth if you are testifying. Incredibly important. And you can see this reflected in our own justice system here in the United States, where you will put your left hand on a Bible if you are a witness. Right hand goes up in the air. And you swear to tell the truth. And just in case you're a little foggy on what that means, the whole truth, all of it, and nothing but the truth. So you don't get to add anything to the truth. So help you God. And, and we swear on the Bible. And if you perjure yourself, meaning that you knowingly lie in court, you're supposed to go to jail for that. It, it, the fines can be extremely high for that type of thing. And again, it's because it's so incredibly serious. So it's it's kind of relegated to this, but it extends to, of course, telling the truth at all times. Last one. You've hung with me. You've done great. And here we go. Last one, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male slave or his female slave or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So here we have it, the Ten Commandments, all of them here. The last one is don't covet. If you're going, I kind of know what coveting is, but not totally sure. I'm totally clear on that. What is it? It's basically resenting somebody because they have something you wish you had. That's my own definition. I think it's a pretty good one. It's not just admiring. Like, like you might admire somebody's things or, or be like, oh man, that's, you know, that's amazing that they got that. Or, or, oh, I wish I could eat like that and look like her. <laughs> have, we, have we ever done that, ladies, to somebody? It's, it's not that. It's really to the point of resenting, like feeling victimized, like I should have that and I don't, and I deserve that and they have it instead. Or I hate them because, because they have something I wish I had. It's, it's that malice that is involved with it. It's the inability to be happy for somebody because they are blessed. By the way, if you can master that alone, you will have a much happier life. I learned that years ago. Rather than being resentful and angry because somebody has something I don't have, 
why would I want to live like that? It breaks God's law, number one. But number two, it's just miserable. I want to be like that. I can have joy. I can share in their joy by simply being happy for them. And so I am. It's wonderful. And I love to tell people who, who get blessed by something, and oh, I'm just so happy for you. I'm just so thrilled for you. And I mean it. And, and it makes them so happy. And it's like this big joy fest. So that might be something that you want to work on if you've never really thought about doing something like that. So that's the that's Ten Commandments. Now, what do we do with all of that? What do we do with all that information? I mean, is it relegated to Israel because God was setting up the nation? Does it apply to us? Well, we said, no, it, it does. It applies to us. There are other rules and regulations that we're going to get to even starting next week that are kind of in a different category that don't apply to us necessarily, but, but these do. So, so what do we do with all of this? Well, this is where you want to buckle your seatbelt because it's going to get a little painful. And I'm just going to ask you, would you hang with me through this, please? Please don't leave. Please embrace, if you have to, the conviction of the Holy Spirit on this, because we're all kind of in this boat together. But here's my question. If I were to say to you, are you a good person? If you're like 99% of Americans, maybe higher, you're going to say, yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, I am. You think you're a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, okay. Well, let's let's see if you're a good person or not. Let's take a little self-stock, shall we? Let's see how many commandments maybe we've broken. So we're going to go through these really quick. And if you could, you can take a pencil and just make a little tally mark if you want to. You can keep track on your fingers. See how many of these you're responsible for breaking. And, and we'll see how your life lines up with my life. All right, here we go. Uh, here is the first one. Have you ever in your entire life put something in the place of God? ever put something in front of him, sports, hobbies, free time, something else, wasting time. <laughs> if you have, I hate to tell you this, but you get a tally mark for that. Um, I forgot to bring mine, but I got a tally mark because I, I've done that and I'm not proud of it. But yeah, I've totally done that. Okay. Second one. Have you ever prayed to anything besides God himself? A statue? a saint? Have you ever gone to a psychic reader? Have you ever had your palm read, tarot cards to tell your future? Are you trusting crystals? All of that would entail this whole graven image worshiping something other than God thing. And it might surprise you to know that I now have two tally marks and I'm suspicious that you might too. And if you're wondering, really, Anne? you're not even Catholic. You what did you do? <laughs> Would you like to know? I'll tell you. And don't poo-poo this because it's serious. I don't know how old I was, but I'm guessing I was maybe six or seven. And there was a picture of Jesus hanging on the wall. And I was all by myself. It wasn't at my home. It was somewhere else. And I got on my knees and I prayed to the picture. And you might be saying, oh, brother, you were only six or seven. I mean, cut yourself some slack. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong because the Holy Spirit was already at work in my little young heart. And I didn't pray for very long. I mean, I was only like six or seven. I don't even know what I said, but I prayed to this picture and I got up off of my knees and I immediately was filled with conviction. Even at that young age, like that was not okay. That was not right. Don't do that. And I remember in my tiny little child, experience saying, God, I'm so sorry. That wasn't, that was not good. And I will never do that again. And I never did. But guess what? Uh, I broke, I broke that commandment, even though I was little, I broke it and I'm responsible for it. So I got two tally marks on that. How are you doing? Next, have you ever taken God's name in vain? Do you think you have, you know, even if you've never said it, is it possible that you have lived your life in a way that would cause other people to dishonor God because they found you to be hypocritical or not a good witness. Because if I extend it to that, then I'm pretty much guilty of that one too. So now I've got three. How are you doing? Next. Okay. Ever dishonored your parents? Even when you were young? All right. We all got that one. <laughs> Moving on, I'm not even going to talk about it because I know we're all guilty. 
Okay. Have you ever murdered anybody? Now I know there's a bunch of you going, Oh, thank goodness. Finally one. I don't have to put the tally mark down on finally. Well, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but let's turn to first John chapter three, verse 15, because here's what the new Testament says. It says everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Do you realize what just happened there? In the eyes of God, if you hate somebody, that's murder to God. Which means I got another tally mark. And I bet you did too. Because I have truly hated people in my life. I'm not proud of it. But I have. And I still struggle sometimes. Maybe not even people I've ever met. But just people that drive me crazy. And I have to really repent of that. So, yeah, technically I'm guilty of murder too. And I bet you are as well. Oh, okay, next one. This is I know. Hang with me. Please don't leave. Have you ever committed adultery? Now, again, maybe like murder you're going, okay, finally one I don't have to put the tally mark down on. Well, <laughs> again, not to burst the bubble, but Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27 to 28, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Obviously, he's referring back to this exact commandment. Jesus says, yes, but I'm going to expand this. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And by the way, that works conversely for us ladies too. If you look at somebody with lust in the eyes of God, you've committed adultery. Let's all just put the tally mark down. Let's just be honest. There you go. So far, I have every single one. I don't know how you're doing. This is not looking good for me at all. Have you ever stolen something? It doesn't matter how valuable. Have you ever stolen anything? Did you ever plagiarize? Ever take office supplies home? Ever swipe something small? Ever take something that belonged to somebody else because you were like, oh, they won't even notice. It doesn't even matter. Well, then you broke that one too. That's another tally mark for you. How about a lie? Okay, let's just move on. <laughs> How many is the question, not if. How many have you done? Innumerable. Just, yes, absolutely all of it. And then lastly, have you ever been resentful of somebody because they had something that you wish you had that you don't? Got that one too. All right, I'm 10 for 10. How'd you do? Maybe, maybe you did great and you're nine for 10. Maybe you're an amazing person and you're eight for 10. But if you did 10 for 10 like I did, I'm not judging you. I'm just going to summarize what we just discovered about ourselves. And here's what you just admitted to. Okay, this is going to be painful. You're an idolatrous, blasphemous, irreverent, disobedient, murdering, adulterer at heart, who's also a malcontented liar and thief. I'm going to leave that up there for just a second. That's what you and I are. Are you a good person? If you have to stand before God on judgment day in his court, and he's the judge, which he is, and that's what you bring to the table, what kind of a judge would let that go? Not a good judge, not a just judge. God is the judge. And salvation is a legal matter. This is what most people do not comprehend and never think about. We talk about, about God as love, which he is, but he's also equally righteous and he is a righteous judge who cannot let sin go unpunished. Can you imagine going into court to see the sentencing of, say, a mass murderer who murdered your family and having the judge say, well, he seems like a nice person, you know? He does buy a lot of Girl Scout cookies, which does help the Girl Scouts out, which is pretty philanthropic if you think about it. So I think the good outweighs the bad. And I think because of that, we're going to go ahead and let this person go. You would shriek. No, you can't. That's not just. That's not okay. You can't just have that outweigh what he did. That has to be dealt with. That has to be paid for. That has to be punished. It's the same thing with you and I. Should you feel remorseful? Yes. But remorse is not enough. Again, think of a court situation. You go in, you're guilty. And you say to the judge, I'm really sorry. Judge is going to be like, good. I'm glad to hear it. Now let's get the sentencing. Because your remorse 
does nothing to pay for the crime. It's good. It's better than not being remorseful. You come with no remorse. That's worse. But it doesn't fix the problem. Does that make sense? We need to fix the problem. Did you know that if you go into traffic court with traffic fines, maybe you sped a lot, you have a bunch of them that have piled up, and somebody else comes in and pays your fines, you are legally allowed to walk out of that court scot-free. Somebody else can pay the fines for you. If you don't believe me, look it up. It's legal. That is what Jesus did. You and I broke God's law, and Jesus paid the fine. It's a legal transaction. When Jesus hung on that cross and died, after suffering the penalty for my sin and yours, that we have no resources to pay. It's like going into traffic court with a trillion dollar fine. There is no way I can pay that. I will never have the resources to pay it. And Jesus steps in and he says, I've got it. I've got the resources. I paid it. He said, it is finished at the end of that. To tell us die was the Greek word. It meant it is finished. He paid in full. So the only question is how do I get that payment applied to me then? If it's not through just being sorry, because we established that that's not enough, it has to be paid for. How does that work? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and, listen to this, just to forgive us our sins. Do you hear the word just? It's a legal transaction, friends. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our only hope when we are as guilty as we are, and by the way, we went through 10 commandments, and I think most of us, if we're being honest, we're guilty of either nine or 10 of all of those. It would be bad enough if it was just 10, but take that 10 and multiply it times, I don't know, how many lies have you told? How many lies have I told? How many times have I sinned against God? It's astronomical. I can't I can't even imagine the number. It might be too big to even count. That's my debt. I get that forgiven by coming before the judge and throwing myself on his mercy. By believing that he did make the payment for my sins. And yes, by confessing it and the remorse and the sorrow that I have that I put him on that cross, that it was my sin that he actively suffered and paid for. And I cry out to him, Jesus, would you apply that to me? Jesus, would you save me? I can't do it. I know I can't do it. I have no resources to do it. I don't bring you my good works. My good works have nothing to do with this. It's not even good to you. It's all bad, all of it. You come empty handed. You come just crushed by your sin and say, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he promises that when that is your heart, when you come before him and you ask for that, you ask for that covering, his righteousness to cover your sin so that God will no longer see you as a sinner, but he sees you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ as holy and right with him that you are completely forgiven. I don't like to pray prayers anymore with you because I feel like it's more real if you do it on your own. I want to give you the information and then ask you to really consider, number one, have you done that? Number two, do you believe that? And number three, are you willing to take some time and get really raw and honest before God? If you've never done that before and come before him and say, I need your mercy. There is something incredibly humbling about coming so empty handed and so destitute. But let me just say this too. There is something so freeing about admitting it and, and stopping the charade of I'm good. I'm a good person when we know Deep, deep down, we know we're not. There's something really freeing about saying, you're right, God, your assessment of me is correct. I am, I'm destitute. Uh, I've got nothing here. And then crying out to him for mercy to save you. And then the product of that just flows out of you, just a desire to serve him and love him and worship him and be available to do anything he asks you to do. That It's not that you're 
those good works save you. Those good works flow out of just sheer gratitude for what he's done. So my hope and my prayer is that if you're listening to this right now, I don't think it's by accident, especially if you've never done that before. Would you think about this, please? Would you really seriously think about it? The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, that our death is God's signal to us that he is really deadly serious about our sin. And we all have an appointment with death. But it goes on to say that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you've never done that, please, please highly consider doing it. That is the way to salvation. And that is the Ten Commandments. Thank you so much for being with us tonight for Bible Study Hub. Lord willing, we will be back next week as we will wrap up chapter 20 of Exodus and go on from there. If you're not part of our Facebook group, we would love to have you join us. It's just Bible Study Hub on Facebook. Lovely group. We pray for each other, love each other, support each other. It's just a wonderful place to be. We also have a YouTube channel by the same name, Bible Study Hub, where you can find past videos nicely organized. Have a wonderful week. I love you dearly. I pray for you. And I will see you again, Lord willing, next Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Good night.